the conflict that had been steadily growing between Washington and General MacArthur finally breaks out into the open as reporters rush from the White House with world-shaking news that will affect international policy in every capital. In Tokyo, General MacArthur prepares to return to the United States to tell his side of the story. The momentary triumph belongs to Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who is the architect of the administration's present Far Eastern policy. If the general does retire to inactive duty, it will be the end of one of the most distinguished military careers in our history. A career that began in 1899, when he entered the United States Military Academy at West Point, where his father served as superintendent. Upon being graduated, he was assigned to the Philippines and started his long training in Far Eastern affairs. He went to France as a major in World War I with the 42nd Division and received the Distinguished Service Cross from General Pershing for his brilliant leadership at Chateau Thierry. He wound up as Brigadier General and in command of the 42nd Division, which he renamed the Rainbow Division. In 1919, he was appointed Superintendent of West Point, the youngest man ever to hold this position. But by this time, setting new records was already an old story to General MacArthur. In 1930, he was promoted to full general and appointed chief of staff by President Hoover. In 1937, he retired and went to the Philippines to organize the Commonwealth's Army as a field marshal. He had soared to military heights and left some hard-to-beat records. He had been the youngest American division commander overseas, youngest chief of staff, the most decorated officer. Then disaster struck at the United States. The Japanese had attacked. General MacArthur was recalled to active service and placed in command of all forces in the Philippine Islands. Later, when the defense of Corregidor became hopeless, he was ordered to Australia. When I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Tonight, I repeat those words. I shall return. And return he did. On October 20th, 1944, a powerful American invasion force struck at Leyte. In the vanguard rode the general, determined to make good on a promise he had given the Filipinos. And as he plunged knee-deep into the surf and waded ashore, it heralded the last gasps of the Japanese war machine. From the invasion beach at Leyte, General MacArthur went on to the historic hour aboard the battleship Missouri, where he ordered the Japanese warlords to sign the dotted line of unconditional surrender. But again, war was to make its demand on MacArthur the soldier. And this time, it was the divided land of Korea that erupted into war. General Douglas MacArthur was appointed Supreme Commander of the United Nations Forces, furnishing assistance to the Republic of Korea. Although the outnumbered UN troops were forced to retreat in the first weeks of battle, they soon built up strength and switched to the offensive. With a brilliant Incheon landing, MacArthur's strategies routed the Red Forces and drove them toward the Manchurian border. At this point, the general's military logic came into conflict with the diplomatic aims of the Allied nations. Many feared that his drive toward the Manchurian border might cause large-scale intervention by red Chinese troops and possibly lead to a third world war. In the midst of this tension, President Truman made a special trip to Wake Island. Here, after an 8,000-mile flight, the president met General MacArthur for the first time. Plans for the future Korean campaigns were discussed in a simple radio shack, and far-reaching decisions were obtained. Once more, harmony reigned over the United Nations team. But the question was, for how long? Then disaster suddenly struck. An estimated quarter of a million red Chinese soldiers attacked the Allied lines. The United Nations troops were forced to retreat. Once more, North Korea was overrun by the communists. In the ensuing months, the fighting settled down to a potential stalemate. On April 5, 1951, chafing under the restrictions that had been placed on his military operations, General MacArthur wrote a letter to Representative Martin, applauding the congressman's demand for use of Chiang Kai-shek's troops to open a second front against the communists. 
President Truman took issue with the letter. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons, to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted, to see that the security of our country and the free world is not needlessly jeopardized, and to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. After an absence of 14 years, General MacArthur returns to the United States and lands at San Francisco amidst deafening cheers. The General has come home to tell his side of the story. On hand to extend California's sunniest welcome to a great war hero is Governor Warren. Mrs. MacArthur and the General's 13-year-old son, Arthur, share the limelight in a throng which all but overwhelms the General in its enthusiasm. Two days later in Washington, a joint meeting of the two houses of Congress is assembled to hear General MacArthur state his position on Far Eastern policy. The General stresses four major points as essential in the present situation. One, permission to bomb Manchurian bases. Two, a blockade of the China coast. Three, vigorous support of Chiang Kai-shek's troops in an attack on the China mainland. And fourth, the retention of Formosa. He ends with a touching valedictory. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. And then it is New York's turn to give a five-star welcome to a five-star hero. The world's greatest city says, welcome home, Mac, with the greatest demonstration in its history. A veritable blizzard of confetti blankets the estimated seven and a half million people who have turned out to pay homage to the general. East side, west side, all around the big town, they form solid walls of spectators. City Hall Square is jammed as Mayor Impeditieri presents a medal to the general in token of New York's affection and esteem. Soldier, general, leader of the American armed forces in two generations of war, Douglas MacArthur has earned his place in America's history. As for the result of President Truman's momentous decision and what it will mean to the American people, only time will tell. <laughs>